Mankind has scanned the heavens for thousands of years. We can now look into deep space, where we're discovering new galaxies and supernovas. But we still find an array of phenomena that continue to mystify us. Cosmic particles are constantly colliding with the Earth. We still know so little about how these tiny collisions affect us. We know for certain that they're an engine of evolution, but also a danger for our genomes. Beyond that, they're capable of disabling entire electricity networks and even influencing the weather. Now an army of scientists is converging to solve the mystery of cosmic radiation, putting their collective knowledge together like a puzzle. They observe events in the universe with the aim of clarifying the very foundations of our existence. They want to know what happens to us within this stream of cosmic particles. But what exactly is this cosmic radiation that affects the Earth? It's a cocktail of different particles, mostly hydrogen and helium nuclei. A large portion of it comes from our own galaxy, the Milky Way while other particles have been traveling through space for billions of years before they enter the Earth's atmosphere. At this stage, no one is absolutely sure where these particles come from. Their origin is probably extragalactic. What's certain is that the Earth moves within the Sun's magnetic field, and the stream of cosmic particles has to pass through the same magnetic field on its way to our planet. There's a very clear connection between the intensity of cosmic radiation as measured here on Earth and the activity of the Sun. The Sun becomes more active every 11 years. During this time, its magnetic field is stronger. This gives us a kind of protective shield, keeping the cosmic radiation particles away from Earth. When the Sun is less active, more of these cosmic radiation particles manage to reach the Earth. At present, the Sun is less active. And that means a lot of cosmic radiation is reaching the Earth. Cosmic radiation usually consists of hydrogen, helium or iron nuclei. All moving at high speeds in space. Where they come from is unknown. The latest research suggests that the active galactic core of the Centaurus A galaxy is one source of high-energy cosmic radiation. A characteristic ring of stardust travels across this galaxy, 14 million light-years away from here. This cosmic radiation gives us constant contact here on Earth with the material produced in faraway galaxies. Our view into outer space is becoming ever deeper. We see millions of stars, star clusters, galaxies, cosmic fog, the remains of former stars and more. They all send cosmic particles our way. Our job is to use them to better understand our world. Yellow diamonds are extremely rare, at least in nature. But one American company is busy producing them en masse. But what's the link between diamonds and stars? Diamonds, the associations of riches and glamour. At the atomic level, a diamond is merely a lump of carbon. But there has to be a difference somewhere because nobody's going to dress up in anthracite. And who would think about chucking diamonds on the fire? The difference lies in the structure of the atoms within the crystal lattice. Whereas normal carbon is built up in layers composed of hexagonal structures, diamonds are made up of spatially complex designs that are called hexarchis octahedrons. Carbon atoms are reluctant to assume this shape at first. It's only at high temperatures and under high pressure that they can form, conditions that exist deep within the Earth. If we look around in space, we can find excellent diamond incubators. When a star reaches the end of its life and collapses, there are just the conditions for diamonds to grow. Astronomers have uncovered a star 
50 light years away that has become one massive diamond. They say it would equal 10 billion trillion trillion carats. Hmm, some rock. But somehow, I don't think that would hang right on a necklace. Sarasota, Florida. Events in this production hall are unsettling the diamond industry. Carter Clark is a retired US general, now fighting the power structure of another industry with all new weapons. These black and blue reactors produce artificial diamonds unlike any the world has ever seen before. And now Clark wants even more reinforcements to combat a diamond market that's worth billions. Rough diamonds up to four and a half carats are manufactured here around the clock. Precise details of the process are strictly confidential. But we know that 3,000 degrees Celsius and massive 50,000 bar of pressure are used to turn graphite into diamonds. It only takes 82 hours here to transform a potential diamond into a rough diamond. And these fakes bear a striking resemblance to their natural cousins. The scientists at General Clark's company have been perfecting the process for years, based on an idea that Clark once brought back from Russia. Well, actually, I was over in uh, Moscow, and I was doing uh, some electronic research. And a scientist approached me one day and asked if I were interested in diamonds. And I said, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm interested in most anything. And frankly, I thought he was going to ask me to invest in a diamond mine. And I could see myself chipping diamonds out of a cave somewhere in Siberia. What the Russian scientist actually had was only a theoretical concept at first. But Clark saw its business potential and recruited the right experts. Chief developer, Dr. Rob Chodelka, optimized the process so that today every stone is absolutely perfect in color and size. An acid bath is used to dissolve the metal core and reveal the diamond. Only yellow diamonds are produced here. Natural yellow diamonds are extremely rare and cost between 15,000 and 20,000 euros, per carat that is. Clark's yellow diamonds only cost 4,000 euros per carat. Diamond industry giant De Beers reacted immediately and developed a new kind of inspection device. The device shoots ultraviolet light through the stones. Significant magnification reveals the irregular growth structure of a natural diamond. This is in contrast to the highly regulated structure of its synthetic counterpart. This is De Beers' approach to diffusing the competition. But You know, if an orchid is grown in the steamy jungle of South America, or it's grown in a hothouse in California, it's still an orchid, it's still very beautiful, and women adore it. And sales figures that are indeed on the rise speak for themselves. Here at Germany's University of Ulm, Professor Hans-Jörg Fecht has managed a revolutionary development a procedure for the manufacture of ultra-thin diamond layers with minute crystal structures in the nano range. Using the very latest technology, today practically any material can be coated with these nano diamonds. No other diamonds, natural or synthetic, have surfaces as extremely smooth as the nano diamonds Professor Fecht has developed. Even tiny tools, hardly visible to the naked eye, can be made from the nano diamonds. GFD, a company specializing in diamond microparts, has used the technology to create a sensational tiny scalpel. Now the nano scalpel for eye surgery has even made it into the Guinness Book of World Records. So diamonds aren't just a girl's best friend. They've also become an all-purpose material in the worlds of industry and science. The test track is the proving ground for the roadworthiness of this new onboard technology. Can the technology contribute to resolving traffic problems? And what's the connection between road traffic and diamonds? 
millions upon millions of cars trundle around our road systems today. For this to happen with any degree of safety, the traffic is controlled by road signs. So they can be clearly seen at night, they reflect the vehicle headlights. This is how they do it. The road sign is made up of a flat metal plate, and it's covered in millions of tiny glass spheres. On top of it, there's a transparent plastic foil with a picture of the road sign printed on it. When a light from a headlamp hits one of these little spheres, it gets bent, and then sent back in the direction it came from, allowing the driver to see it. The road sign seems self-illuminated. The cut that transforms diamonds into brilliance, well that does just the same. Light falling on it is refracted and reflected many, many times before it re-emerges. In special cuts, the rays of light can even be split into their component colors. This is where precious stone cutters talk of the jewels of fire. So you see, if it was just a matter of the physics, well, we could all just hang a stop sign around our necks. Researchers from Karlsruhe, Germany, are tinkering with the unmanned vehicles of the future. Ants, fish and other creatures are already genetically programmed to recognize obstacles, spatial intervals and distances. But anyway here has to learn to precisely calculate all these things. The issue here isn't horsepower, it's brain power. Anyway also runs without a driver. Will humans soon just be extra weight in cars? I estimate that in no more than 20 to 30 years it will technically be possible to drive accident free. Probably you will still have permission to drive your car yourself, but if it gets to the point where the risk of an accident is too great, the vehicle will simply take over from you until the danger has passed. This kind of situation is one example. A child runs out into the road. The accident is unavoidable. A solution is planned for this kind of scenario in the future. At the Fraunhofer Institute in Karlsruhe, Germany, researchers are teaching cars to talk. It already works in the simulation. The cars communicate with each other and avoid a crash. In the Car-to-Car -car Communication Consortium, Prominent car manufacturers are working together to ensure that all of their vehicles learn to speak the same language. The following situation is a good example. The car and motorcycle can't see each other, but with both sending out radio signals, their drivers are warned in time. Even a lorry that's had a breakdown will transmit radio signals in the future, giving early warning to the approaching driver that there's an obstacle and so prevent an accident. And it won't just be the cars that are communicating. In the future, construction sites or roadblocks will also transmit and receive information. Streams of data are conquering the motorway. VW is working together with traffic scientists from the University of Dresden to develop a system designed to reduce the hazards of construction sites in the future. Today's the first field test for what we're calling the construction site pilot. The researchers position a mobile transmitter and receiver at the start and at the end of the site. The test drive begins. The car gathers all of the information it requires. How long is the construction site? Is there heavy traffic? Are there any obstacles coming up? At the end, the data are submitted to the construction site pilot. The mobile unit processes the information and transmits it to the oncoming vehicles. Better information for drivers and less congestion on the motorway. This is the mission of the new system. The construction site causes a four-minute delay. The display depicts the precise route and all possible obstacles. At the end, the system accelerates automatically. The more cars are equipped with these kinds of pilots, the smoother traffic flows. In Karlsruhe, the researchers are taking a step that goes even further. They want to completely replace drivers. The only reason a human's behind the wheel at all is for safety reasons. Will Anyway hit the brakes on time? 
The car manages the junction without any human help. The car manages almost all the tasks on the test site without the driver having to intervene. But the level of traffic here is quite low. In more complicated situations, Anyway reacts with something akin to confusion. But the car recognizes simple obstacles. Well, at least most of the time. Admittedly, it will still be a few years at least before Anyway and other intelligent vehicles can take their place in road traffic. Here in Germany's Eiffel mountain range, geologist Ulrich Schreiber is tracking down a very special phenomenon. There are a conspicuously large number of anthills along the geological fault zone here. But what do ants have to do with traffic problems? We human beings have an ambivalent relationship to ants. On the one hand, we wonder at their diligence and ability to tackle problems of their infrastructure while on the other, we're only marginally impressed when they march in convoy through our kitchens. It's the same with our lines of communication. Great when everybody wants to get from A to B quickly, but not through my backyard, please. But there is a difference between these two types of road usage. On our roads, there are traffic jams. On our roads, there are none. But if you look more closely, you can see that there isn't a difference in the roads, only in the attitudes of the individual participants. Whereas we people tend to think that other road users are a traffic disruption and only we have urgent business, an ant couldn't care less who gets there first. The ant's secret is that they don't overtake. So a stream of ants is one where they all travel at the same speed and there are no ant tailbacks. Theoretically, this could also work for car drivers, but only when everyone joins in. And that is about as likely as a traffic jam for ants. Lach Lake is the crater of the largest volcano in Germany's Eiffel mountain range. It last erupted 13,000 years ago, and it could reawaken at any time. If that happens, every living thing in its vicinity will be in danger. What happened before could easily happen again. Rising magma meets groundwater, and the volcano explodes. Rivers of lava flow toward the Rhine Valley, blocking the river flow and entire cities sink under the force of mud landslides. Geologist Professor Ulrich Schreiber has studied the Eiffel volcanoes very closely, and he's convinced that he's found evidence of a coming eruption. No one can forecast precisely when it will come, but the gas bubbles constantly rising from the floor of Lach Lake are an indication of a fault zone in the Earth's crust. These faults permeate the entire area. Geologists can recognize them on the basis of specific land shapes. And Professor Schreiber has discovered yet another characteristic. In excursions throughout the whole of Europe, he has seen hundreds of anthills running along fault zones again and again. Professor Schreiber is convinced that this is no coincidence. What draws the ants here? Are they aware that something is afoot in the depths below? Professor Schreiber finds one clue after the other to support his theory, running precisely along the geological fault, just as he expected. Jetzt kommen die nächsten. The next das ist ja nicht zu fassen. Ja, also das geht ja doch wie im It's unbelievable. Lehrbuch weiter. It's almost like a das textbook I haven't habe. written yet. Das, das ist ja Wahnsinn, was hier jetzt ist. Sehen Sie mal dort. Das ist der nächste. And as expected, there's the next hier one. Eindeutig so the next one would have to come from that direction. Wenn wir jetzt rumgucken, müsste der nächste irgendwo in der Richtung kommen. Ja, schauen sure Sie mal enough, vorne. Look over there. And there's more. The ants need pine needles as their building material. So what are they doing here in the middle of a deciduous forest? Professor Schreiber is certain that the ants come to the fault zones intentionally. The overview shows that these two well-documented fault zones cross north of Lach Lake. Around the area where they intersect, in an east-west direction, Professor Schreiber finds 16 anthills in a single day. 
Mine gases rise from below the ground where geological layers show cracks and faults. Professor Schreiber measures a characteristically higher mine gas level next to an anthill. Do ants perceive these mine gases? And would they react to changes taking place underground? A test is aimed at getting to the bottom of this rare phenomenon. In the Animal Physiology Department at the Humboldt University in Berlin, Dr. Stefan Hetz examines insect senses. Ants are experts at communicating by using chemical substances. And they also seem to have other talents that researchers have not discovered before. Stefan Hetz is ready to conduct his specially developed experiment to find out whether or not the ants recognize the subterranean mine gases. They're spread randomly around the test field without any external influence. Then things get more exciting. What happens if samples of mine gases are introduced? The gases are warmed up slightly, just like when they emerge from inside the Earth. The natural conditions are replicated here as realistically as possible. And then the ants begin exploring the area. Over time, the ants feel drawn to the spots where gas is escaping. They form groups at the four openings. When the ants smell different gases, they stop briefly. They notice that something is there and they stop in their tracks. And the other thing is the temperature gradient. They notice even the slightest temperature changes. How these things are connected is something we'll have to investigate in the future. If ants react to the slightest changes underground, it is possible that they might also notice the signs leading up to an earthquake. Filling up at the airport. Aircraft in the future may replace kerosene as a jet fuel with hydrogen. But is that really possible? And what do hydrogen and ants have in common? Hydrogen is a perfectly elegant source of energy. When it's burnt, it produces no environment damaging CO2, but pure water vapor. Regrettably though, this flammable gas is not without its disadvantages. It's very difficult to store. Either it needs to be extremely compressed and held in heavy thick walled flasks, or you can cool it until it becomes a liquid. But that first happens when it reaches minus 253 Celsius. But there is another way that scientists have recently stumbled upon. Instead of storing the hydrogen itself, store a rich source from which the gas can be obtained. And such a source is formic acid. This is the stuff that ants use to protect themselves from predators. And it's the same stuff that makes the stinging metal sting. If you bring iron into contact with formic acid in daylight, voila, hydrogen gas and CO2 are produced. Chemists call such phenomena catalytic decomposition. This technology could allow us to drive around using the ants for chemical weapons. But it's a dream if you think you can just turn up at an ant hill and fill up. Since the beginning of the jet age, the level of air traffic has increased unceasingly. And experts are anticipating a threefold increase in traffic over the next 20 years. With more than 80,000 flights every day, aviation is slowly but surely becoming climate killer number one. Can more economical aircraft prevent this? Hardly. As it stands, today's high-tech jets like the huge Airbus A380 are as close to fuel efficient as they ever can be. Things weren't always this way. 1942, saw the introduction of the world's first mass-produced jet aircraft, the Messerschmitt 262. The Messerschmitt was thirsty, guzzling 250 litres of jet fuel per man per 100 kilometres. By the 1960s, transatlantic jets had already improved this to 15 litres of jet fuel per passenger per 100 kilometres. 
The mighty new Airbus only needs one-fifth of this at three liters per passenger per 100 kilometers. So experts know that optimizing jet fuel consumption is approaching its limits. This led to a new idea back in the 1990s of using hydrogen for large aircraft instead of jet fuel. The idea, electrolysis. Electricity transforms water into jet fuel. It sounds almost too good to be true. The vision for the future is to have facilities all over Germany. They transform surplus electricity into hydrogen. In contrast to electricity, this gas can be stored hundreds of meters under the earth in so-called caverns. Pressurized fuel lines run to the airport, where aircraft can now fill up on liquid hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen? Yes, that's already around even today at the industrial level. This is one of Europe's largest hydrogen to liquid conversion plants, located in Leuna, Germany. Wir verflüssigen 3000 Liter in einer Stunde. We liquefy 3,000 litres an hour, that's five tonnes a day or one and a half cars per day. That's the average we can liquefy at full production capacity. The first step is handled by this tank, containing liquid nitrogen at minus 200 Celsius. The hydrogen that arrives here at room temperature, which is then cooled down to minus 200 Celsius. But the gas only liquidizes when it hits minus 250 degrees Celsius. This additional cooling can only be accomplished by expanding the gas. Turbines pull the gas molecules apart. The temperature keeps sinking until liquid hydrogen finally emerges. In liquid form, hydrogen only needs half as much space as when it's a gas. Liquid hydrogen is also easier to transport. This makes it very attractive for aviation purposes. But even today's most advanced aircraft couldn't fill up with liquid hydrogen and use it in their engines quite yet. First of all, to fly as far as they can today, they would need fuel tanks that are four times the size of normal jet fuel tanks. And the tanks would need to be well insulated to ensure that the frozen hydrogen didn't evaporate. Special containers will be needed, ideally in a piggyback position on the aircraft. While this does increase the level of drag, hydrogen's extremely light weight means that the overall load is still lighter. Passengers wouldn't notice anything, and the environment would probably benefit as well.